So I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, the unique student identifier validation um, improvements that we've done um, in the last release, which happened just before the um, just before the beginning of this year. And some of you are probably already using some of these features as well. So um, hopefully they'll be familiar to you. Um, one of the major improvements we've done is being able to validate just with the click of a button. So it comes up and tells you whether or not the um, the USI is valid. Yes, David, you've got your hand up. Are you, do you have a question? Or? Uh, yes, I do. If I yep. want to get my bean counter to come in, it's a new bean counter, do I need to send her your email to get a link or can you do yeah. something from your end? Yeah, you send her the, send her the email that you've got and um, she can connect in. All right, thank you. Yep. And I'll uh, I'll let it through the... Let's have a look. I'll just check that there's... Um, if you need to talk to me, you can talk to me on the chat. Yeah, so the unique student identifier validation um, enables you to click at a click of a button, validate you aside. Something you're probably not aware of, um, and maybe there's limited use for this, but um, you can actually set up the system to be able to validate the USI completely at registration. Um, that can be a bit of a barrier to enrollment. So a student may, for example, um, not like the idea of having to get the USI perfectly right, um, and might prefer just to uh, get it wrong to start with, get their name wrong, um, and then submit. But if you want to, you can actually have the USI um, be validated and their first names, last name, and birth date to be validated as part of that process. So the form won't actually submit until it's validated. So effectively, you're getting um, enrollment forms that are completely validated with regards to USI. Um, so that can be something you can think about. If you've got a lot of problems associated with that, um, then and you're not too fussed about people being sort of put off, um, you can do that. Okay, let's start the slides. Okay, so I'll start off talking about what the unique student identifier is. You're probably going to be pretty familiar with it, but um, I'll mention it anyway. And just to recap, um, just a few obligations that an RTO has about the USI, which you're probably familiar with already. What options you've got available around validation um, and how you can set up and modify each option with some questions at the end, some, uh, some tests for you, just to check that you've been listening intently. Uh, so what is the USI? Uh, let's just check to make sure we don't have anyone here. No, that's good. Um, what is the USI? Well, the USI is the um, unique um, identifier set up by the Australian government. Um, you have to validate it before sending um, statements of attainment. I think that's an obligation as being an RTO. Um, there's also a, a requirement for you to submit valid USIs to in your EBITMAS data. So it's worthwhile trying to get that information correct prior to getting to the point of, um, of submitting your EBITMAS data because to try and get correct information about a student after they've attended the course is somewhat difficult. And I'm sure you've probably had experiences on that. Um, so it's, it's required for nationally accredited training. So not required for um, non-accredited training. So if you do happen to be delivering non-accredited training, then feel free to have a different form that doesn't capture the USI. In fact, if it's not a crypto train, you don't even have to capture all those eventless information either. Um, it is required for Commonwealth um, financial assistance. So if any of you are looking at doing funding, that would be a requirement. Um, and before issuing any qualifications or statements of attainment, which you mentioned earlier. Um, is anyone familiar with any other obligations in relationship to the USI? No. No? Yeah, so I think the other thing too to keep in mind is that to get the USI set up, I think all of you have the USI set up, but it does require access to the uh, MyGov ID. And if you do even need to do um, validations, because sometimes the web service from the USI group does stop working. So while the web service might stop working, you might still be able to validate via the website. Um, and if you do get in that situation where we're not able to validate USIs because of whatever reason, then you need to have access to the MyGov ID to get access to USI validation. So it's worthwhile putting that in place prior to the sort of essential time that you need to start doing that. Usually the delays with regards to USI validation are fairly short. You know, you, you I mean, the most I think the USI web service has been down is sort of uh, three or four hours. Um, and usually they try and make that at night. If it's not at night, then um, you've just got one day to wait. So hopefully you can get it validated after that. So 
So some of the challenges faced with the USI is students might not have a USI and um, the best thing to do is to get the, either the student to register themselves or you to register themselves via the USI um, website portal. Um, sometimes students forget their USI, um, a bit of a nightmare when that happens, but um, you can always use the USI website. In fact, the feature we're looking at introducing is the ability to do a lookup. So at the moment we have an ability to validate a USI, we're thinking of adding another button in there, which actually then takes the first name, the last name, the date of birth, um, and some other identifier, and, ver and actually gets the USI from the system. So that's a feature yet to be um, explored, but um, that's definitely on the list of things to do. Um, often the students provide invalid details if they change their name and USI numbers actually change as well. So it's possible for a USI to be rescinded and then the new USI to be issued to a student. So um, don't be surprised if, if that happens. Um, and we know how much effort it is to make sure this works. So hopefully we've given you enough tools to be able to validate USIs effectively. Um, in fact, something that we came across recently um, with a customer is that they couldn't get the USI verified. So a student couldn't verify the USI because they had, a, had an apostrophe. Their name was O'Keefe. And for some reason, there, there was a mix up. And I think the USI registry had changed the name um, and had missed out the comma uh, or the, the apostrophe. And that was causing lots of problems. So in the meantime, what we did is we um, suggested just as an interim measure, you can use the, um, the code INT OFF. And this, this stands for International Students Offshore. Now, this should really only be used for um, students who are international offshore, but it can be a way of getting past the validation if it's too tricky. You will have to sort that out by the time you get to your um, USI, uh, sorry, your AVETMIS validation, because the adeptness validation is going to require um, you to have the correct address for that student because obviously you can't put a local address for a student that you're claiming is offshore and international. But um, that, that's a little trick you can play to get past the USI validation. I definitely don't suggest you tell students about that. <laughs> you don't want students using it off and, and uh, getting away with it. So the possible errors you might get, um, the primary one is actually a fails check character test. Now, this is when you have the USI and it fails the check. And this can happen both on the, the customer side. Um, if you're using the uh, Vetmus 8 USI validation, um, that can happen to the customer. It can happen to you as well when you're filling in the data. Now, what this means is the actual number is incorrect. Now, it, it passes a whole lot of other tests. So it'll pass the fact that there are the required number of digits, which is 10. It'll pass the fact that they are, they are all uppercase. It'll pass the fact that there, there should be numbers and letters, um, but it may still fail the character test. Now, this, this check character test is actually, um, it's a bit like credit cards. The last number on your credit card actually represents a hash or some sort of technical thing of all the previous numbers. And if the, that last number doesn't match what it expects, then you're going to have um, you're going to have trouble. And that's what that that final um, character um, in a USI does. So if you don't have the correct sort of uh, digits and numbers, um, letters um, that match what the last letter would expect, you're going to get it wrong. So if you have this coming up, the actual number is wrong. So look for things like S's that have been entered instead of fives or round the other way. Um, you can't enter ones or uh, ones or zeros, I don't think, because I think they are um, they're excluded from the USI, but they're just look for differences that might be a human error in association with entering the USI. Um, so that fails check character test is, is basically the USI is wrong. It's nothing to do with the name or the surname or the birth date. It's actually the number itself could not possibly be correct. Okay, so here's some options available. I'm going to get, show you what you can do in course sales now. Um, you can have automated validation and correction. Um, that's what most of you have set up. So that if somebody comes in, submits their Avetmas data, that Avetmas data includes the USI. The USI is verified. If it doesn't match verification, then 
um, USI reminder step is applied. If it does, it's, it's USI verified. So we're going to show that in a moment. Um, validation on the form by the course administrator. Um, so basically that's clicking the validate USI button, which is a new feature. So you click that on the right-hand side and it validates the USI against the birth date and the first name and last name. And in fact, you don't actually have to save the form to be able to do this. So you could, for example, just change the name and then just push the validate USI button. But make sure if it's correct, you then click on the save or the apply button for the enrollment for the document. But you can, because sometimes it's actually worthwhile. Someone's written um, Kev and their actual name obviously is going to be Kevin. Well, in this case, anyway, I reckon. Give it a go. Put Kevin in there if it works. Click on the USI verify. You could go. Then click on save. And then you've saved the correct information um, into the system. Um, the, the student can verify during enrollment. Like I said, you can actually have a validation to make sure that we do a validation check against the first name, last name, date of birth, and, and USI. That's possible. Um, and then a manual verification by the administrator, which is effectively the same thing um, as validation on the form. Um, and remember, too, this information appears on the registration list. So it can appear on the registration list, and it can also appear in the trainer portal. And the trainer portal can be used to send off the US for validation as well. So if you have trainers who are sitting in the class and they, I mean, theoretically this, this won't happen in most cases, but if you do have a situation where you get a last minute booking and the USI needs to be validated, the, the actual trainer can send off the USI for validation using the trainer portal. Any questions there? Am I going too fast or too much detail, not enough detail? I'm okay. You're okay? Great. USI is exciting things to talk about, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the USI status field. Now just be aware there is a USI status field on the documents. And this is where we update where what the status is of the USI. We'll tell you what's wrong. So for example, that the, um, the, the name is wrong, the surname or the last name or the date of birth or the, um, the USI um, uh, itself. Doesn't, doesn't match up. We'll give you the information. Now we'll do that on the document so we can include it in the emails that get sent out. So we can send an email to the student now telling them what's wrong with the USI, which is pretty useful. Um, and it can also be included on registration lists as well to give the trainer a bit of an idea so they can, they can troubleshoot with the, with, the, um, with the student. Okay, so you can see here, we've got the registration comes in. I'll just get my form here. So you've got the registration that comes in. And uh, this goes here to the USI validation service. Um, at this point, if it's valid, um, we go to, we go, well, we haven't got it here, but if it's valid, we go to this point here, all the way through to USI verify. If it's not, we go to USI reminder, and then we go down here to email, uh, to an email with the form link. Okay, that's to the student. So if we hit hello. USI reminder, oh, hello. Hello there. No, I thought someone was still. <laughs> um, so we, we, get, we send an email to the student um, and we ask them to verify um, their USI. They fill out the form, which takes them to um, the USI reminder response. And then it goes back to validation service in the back here again. So it's a verified, it shoots over to, um, goes to shoots over here to USI verified. Um, if not, it goes to a USI reminder. Um, and you might see that occasionally. Most of these steps, so the USI reminder and USI reminder response, these tend to be hidden steps because they're automated, but you might see them occasionally in the documents. Does anyone, is anyone familiar, has anyone seen those USI reminder and USI reminder response steps on documents and wondered what the heck's going on? Uh, this is ridiculous. Oh, Joe. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, Scotty, I have seen it. Um, I do not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Joe must be having problems with their, uh, his sound or something. Like sound cool. cool. So the other option is this USI validation on the form. This is like a manual validation. Oops, Daisy, what have I done there? It's like a manual validation. 
And basically, if you click on this validate USI button, like I was mentioning, it takes the unique student identifier and the date of birth, um, and also the first name and the last name, and it validates to get against the USI um, database. Um, and but clicking, be aware that clicking on that validate USI button, that's not what um, then marks the document as having a valid USI. That's just a manual check. Okay, the actual check is applying the USI verified step. So if you, this is like a, a temporary way for you to double check, have you got the details right? Once you've done that, click on save and it'll be sent off for um, verification just to make sure it's correct. Okay, so just make sure, and usually that's done using the registration step and you choose not to send emails because you don't want to send emails every time, but that will send the USI for verification. The other way to do that is to apply the update student detail step. Those are usually the two steps that are able to go and validate the USI to enable it to progress to the next stage within the workflow. So you can, if you set up your, um, your USI field to have the validator a Vetmus 8 USI lookup, then what happens is that same validation that occurs actually is performed on the form while the student is enrolling. Now, obviously, this can be really good for making sure you get completely valid USIs, which is, which is pretty handy because you don't want to sort of muck around with having USIs that don't quite, um, don't quite match. But it can also be a bit of a pain because it slows down the enrollment process. So the student might not be able to enroll as quickly otherwise. So that can be implemented, but it does have, have drawbacks. Um, and the other, um, the other validator, the Avetmus 8 USI validation, that just makes sure that um, uh, the, the checksums all match, okay? So remember I talked about how the last digit has to be representative of the previous digits. It does that sort of validation. It also does the making sure it's 10 characters and those sorts of things before it sends it off to the USI um, web service to get checked. Okay, here's the quiz. Let's see who's been, who's been paying attention. Big points available here. Okay, so when does a student usually receive an email? If the USI is not validated, when the student name is incorrect. That's a joke. You're pretty good. I have missed out on half of this because my headset kept on... Um, muting and I couldn't hear what you were saying but oh no <laughs> oh that's no good oh dear yeah. well you've done pretty well though you got the you got it right uh, fortunately I've had, had a lot to do with this kind of stuff so it's all <laughs> that's good to do a it's refresher okay. we're um we've got a recording so you can uh, you can listen back to it later if you want to have listen to it thank you But yes, those are the two so we don't we don't tend to send a um, an email off for US when the USI is validated um, however, it can be your way. So I know that some workflows have been customized such that the USI being validated is the reason to send off the registration um, message to the student. So in that case, that will happen at that point. Um, but generally speaking, if the USI is validated, we don't really do anything special. Um, we just go, yay, great, just validated and move on. Um, and the USI shouldn't be blank. So we should be making that a mandatory um, field, yeah. um, a little bit like all the other events fields. Uh, last thing we want to do in in January and February is try and literally chase people up for the USI. So definitely try and avoid that. Okay, so which statement is correct? Number one. Okay. We'll say is correct. Both trainer and courseman can truly use their validation for student. That is correct. And, and yeah, this, yeah. A is a little bit ambiguous, isn't it? Because yeah. what I was meaning is course administrators. Course administrators don't need to have a MyGov ID set up because they can use course sales. But if they're not going to use course sales, then you're right. They're going to have yeah. to have MyGov's um, ID set up. So... And the trainers and the course admins can trigger a USI validation for the student because um, that's going to be heading to um, 
that's going to be the way the student, the, the trainer does it via the, the portal. They yeah. can apply the registration step and that registration step will trigger the USI to be sent off for validation. Okay, next question. I, <clears throat> everyone, everyone else is, only, it's between David and Joe. Everyone else is a bit nervous. I had a button to say that. And I so what, A and D? A and D. Mm. So it is actually possible to put a button on the form. Mm. That is a button on the form, even for the customer, even for the student. So we haven't talked about that. But yeah, it is actually possible to put a, a button, just like you have within the admin area, that says mm. validate USI. So that is possible. Um, and uh, the, the issues we have with that is sometimes the USI validation service is a little bit slow. Um, and I don't know if you found that. Um, or have found that yet, but every now and then that we find the validation service gets a little bit overwhelmed with the number of requests and it takes a little bit of time for the validation to come through. So that's one of the risks associated with that, I guess. Now we've got, oh, here we go. Uh, here we go, this an, I think that's the last question. Size which is not loaded, which is not, which will not be a likely cause for marriage because they fail, but can fail, which will not. It's a bit of form, uh, form is not saved and published. Bit of word which, gymnastics going on there, right? Yeah, it is, <laughs> isn't it? Which will not be a likely cause for the delivation configuration failing. After configuring the system, Phil does not have correct validation, not using the correct form. USI is incorrect, which will not be a likely cause. That's correct. That's correct. Well done. Yeah, so if the USI is incorrect, that's good. That's, that's what the validation is meant to do. It's meant to verify that the USI is incorrect. So, you know, the validation is therefore working. But, um, but often when you make changes to the forms, the most frequent thing is the forms are not saved and published. Someone will save a form, but they won't publish it. So it's sitting there waiting to go out, it's sitting waiting in the gates. But until you publish it, it isn't made live. So a form needs to be saved and published to be made live. Yeah. Um, but having said that, it, you know, it's very easy when you're doing this sort of testing to be entering the USIs incorrectly. You think you've got it right and you keep copying and pasting the same USI in and actually you've gone written down the USI incorrectly. So it's worthwhile checking that as well, just to make sure what is happening is what you expect to happen. So.